we're at Cafe Tempo, and with me is Executive Chef Tim Johnson. I'm going to go back in the kitchen and cook with him in a little bit. But first, I'd like to, you to know more about Tim. Tim, thank you for taking the time to visit with us today and cook with us today. When did your career begin as a chef? Well, what happened was I was struggling to try to find out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I was an actor in high school, I was a painter in high school, I was very creative. And then I decided, well, you know, I really like cooking. I started working at the Kansas City Country Club in the middle 80s, and at that time, that's when my uh, experience really grew, learning how to cook for, you know, large groups and work for a demanding clientele and work for a demanding German chef and sous chef. Um, and, but I was really good. I got promoted to the upstairs restaurant and um, the chef told me if I ever really wanted to continue, I should go to chef school. And uh, that's when I decided to go to the New England Culinary Institute in Montpelier, Vermont. Um, it's an intense two-year program where you have school for six months and then you go on a six-month internship. And that was really exciting because um, on my second internship, I went out to San Francisco and worked for Bon Appetit Management Company. Wow, that's an experience. That's an yes. experience because they have a lot of different venues. Um, they run university food service, um, they run business parks, they run corporate dining rooms, and then they also have a catering division, which is where I was working at. Um, so I did my internship there, and after it was over, they offered me the position of an executive sous chef. And so, while there, I did some amazing parties. Um, I did a sit-down dinner for Nelson Mandela for about 3,500 people. Mm -hmm. And what was really funny about that story is he was, he was ill and they didn't think he was gonna come. And so upper management thought we were gonna have 50% no-shows. And so they told us only, you know, cook 50% of the food. Okay. And, you know, we're in a large uh, stadium, you know, cooking food for all these people. And we were all in walkie-talkies, and then we heard that he was coming, and this was 90 minutes out. And my chef um, was English, and when he would get excited, he would stutter. And he was telling me, Sh -sh -sh Chef Tim, get back to the kitchen, and I can't say this word, and cook the rest of the food. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I had five tilt skillets there and 10 convection ovens, and I remember just because we had everything ready, and I cooked for another 1,500 people and got it all ready to go in a half hour to the proper kitchens, and we had 10 of them set up that were satellite kitchens. So that was one of my favorite uh, things that I've ever done. So if, you, if you've done that, you can do anything. <laughs> you can do almost anything. Right. I came back to Kansas City, and I was one of the uh, chefs that helped open up Grand Street Cafe. That's when I found a, a little special place in my heart and where I met my mentor. Um, it was called uh, Seabree Galleries. And that's a special place in everyone's heart on 55th and, and Oak. Yeah, 55th and Oak, and it was owned by Marion Seabree, but then she sold it to uh, Jeannie Beals, and we changed the name to Crestwood Galleries, and we had that for a long time. I started working there in 1993. It was about the year 2000 where Mrs. Beale became ill, and Shirley Helsberg came in and bought us, and at the same time, she wanted to expand. And so we closed down for about 18 months, and she purchased Webster House. And so we reopened that in the spring of 2004, and it was just a gorgeous building. The other piece is that you're connected to the Nerman Museum, and I know that part of, mm -hmm. you know, your tagline is art, art on, on, a a, on a plate, <laughs> and so what a great uh, uh, melding mm -hmm. of artistic, Endeavors. It, it was just, a, I mean, I came up with that phrase and it was just a natural for me. I mean, it, you know, as soon as we got in here and started with the marketing, it's like, oh, I'm going to make it art on a plate. And I always tease Bruce that they're coming in for my food and not for his artwork, but we, we, go, we, we go round and round. But Bruce is a great guy and he, he's built us a lovely space uh, with the help of the Nermans and the Rainiers. So it's, this is just a great place to work. We want to be able to attract the people that are coming into the museum. 
We also want to be able to serve the faculty and staff and administration uh, so they can have a nice lunch. And we also try to make it affordable that the student body can actually come in here too. I would say that that's true. And what I love is not only is there the menu for the day, but you get to see uh, plated dishes. Our specials. We have uh, pasta specials, fresh fish specials, a flatbread, a quiche, and then a special dessert every day. Our desserts are incredible. They're have, incredible. I would like to talk about the <laughs> carrot cake. <laughs> we, no, have, we have the just... carrot cake, the coconut cake. Um, people come and share those because they're a little large, but we, we want them to be able to be shared because that's the whole purpose of community. So you're on campus which means you have an opportunity to work with students. So that's a different level for you from your previous work. My and previous experience, you know, we had professionals, but like all our, our servers and all the people that work for us um, in our restaurants are, are, are some of the students, and mostly of them are international students. Um, I have three interns from the hospitality program, uh, one's from Brazil, one's from the Philippines, and one's from Overland Park. Um, so it's a great, it's, it's exciting to be able to teach young minds and show them how to do things. Um, you know, I always say that a chef is part psychologist, <laughs> part artist, part actor, part businessman, and part teacher. Because uh, if you're not willing to teach people how to do things your way and it, for them to take a little bit of you with them as they develop their career, then, you know, why bother? So does that, you, you know, I always ask the chefs, what keeps you fresh and what keeps you that creative spark going? Do you think the teaching piece contributes to that? Well, part of that, I have to be on my game to teach them every day. But in my career, you, as a chef, if you're the same thing as you were when you were 22, then you're, you're not learning. So I have to keep learning and I have to keep reinventing myself. You know, in the early 90s, you know, I was about all in the veal cooking, and then I got into fusion cooking, and then, you know, Pan-Asian, and, the, but all along, probably the thing that was pulling me um, to find my central heart and passion is locality and using local produce, finding the best fresh things that we can use, um, you know, sustaining the community and sustaining the local businesses and farmers. And we've developed a, a great program out here as far as buying local produce and meats and, and different products. And that, you know, that's the way cooking should be. You can taste that. You can taste it because there's the freshness that can't be accomplished any other way. And we know that when you go to prepare a dish, if it's not fresh and of good quality, you can season and cook and mm -hmm. you're still not going to get the result that you get with the food that you prepare here. And it's more nutritious it's more because nutritious. it's fresh and it's had a chance to get the nutrients from the earth the way right. it was supposed to. And then we don't, you know, leave a carbon footprint, you know, on our beautiful planet that's giving us all this wonderful produce. Well, thank you for taking such good care of our planet and such good care of our dummies with your magnificent cooking. And I think we should go into the kitchen and cook. Okay. Okay? That's great. <laughs>
And these beets actually came from our student farm along with the uh, squash blossoms. So we, we love that part, that it's local, sustainable, organic. And if I can cut a beet, anybody can. And don't cut your finger off. And after we peel them, we're gonna just cut them into four equal parts. Because our goal is to roast them, We're right? gonna roast them in the oven. Yes. For about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna take There'll be any beet left when I'm done with this. <laughs> Hello. I don't think about using gloves, but these are inexpensive and you can keep a box. Can Actually, a box. I'll tell you when I use these gloves. When I'm I'm one of the weenies, if I'm cutting up a jalapeno. You I'm one of better. the people. Well, and I know people who don't, and it, it stings me. So I actually have these gloves in my home. They're part of my kitchen equipment. Okay, now, what are we doing with our raw beets? Then we're just gonna put a little olive oil or grapeseed uh -huh. oil or canola oil on it. And then we're gonna- No seasoning at no this point. No seasoning at this point. And we're just gonna kind of create a little chimney for it, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna roast it in the oven for about 40 minutes. A chimney, so we, so let the so, steam out. So the steam out, okay. it's in the way. The beets have been roasting in the olive oil mm -hmm. and they're ready to go. Right. You started out on low. Started on low. And either by sound or by sight, when it's fairly, when it's fairly well chopped up, then you start slowly drizzling olive oil into it until you get this consistency. That's right. Which, so before we begin preparing the squash blossoms for their tempura batter, this is a trick of the trade. And that is underneath this <laughs> cutting board is a damp towel. How many times have we been home cutting on our cutting boards and the board sliding around and we're trying to manage a sharp knife with whatever um, <laughs> products we're working with and you don't need to. Thank you, chef. Okay, <laughs> now what are my instructions? First of all, these are absolutely gorgeous. Let me tell you something about squash blossoms. Okay. There's a male and a female and there's a winter variety and then the summer variety. Mm -hmm. um, the male will always have um, a, st a stamen in it and you have to go in there really gently with your pinky finger and pop it out. And is it just it's bitter? You just don't want right, it. Right, that's all the pollen because that's oh, what it, it shoots out to, yeah. to to get the rest of the flowers. Now, being a good chef in my mise en place, my assistant already picked all the Some <laughs> We don't have assistants at home, so in the event that you don't, just put your little finger just in there. Put your little there finger you in there, and, and then there you go. So it's now, gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Just now, these beautiful. come off um, zucchini, yellow squash. Um, pumpkins, uh, you know, anything that has a blossom in it, you can use for this dish. And, and again, if, if you don't have squash blossoms, there are other things that you can use in their place. Well, you can, you know, I mean, anything that you want to stuff with cheese or just maybe the herb itself. Sage is a perfect mm -hmm. thing to use as a tempura. Um, you could also get creative and wrap the cheese of your choice. Um, like a goat cheese or the blue cheese mm -hmm. um, or a harder cheese with basil, toothpick it, and then maybe refrigerate it for a little bit, then put that into the tempura. That's always an excellent thing to do. Standing, yeah. Now we're gonna stuff our squash blossom. And I'll do the first one and then you can do I'm the second one. I'm paying very close attention. But you just wanna make little footballs and stuff them in there. So cute. My footballs are too big, uh-uh. And then after you do that, you have it looking something like that. Yes. And then you kind of want to just twist the leaves at the top, okay? So can you do that one? You know what, I can. Let's get this other one done. I see, so you, you insert the cheese up to the point at which it sort of flowers uh -huh. out, and then you, you twist gently it. twist it. I'm gonna rip the leaves off and put it on the plate. And this plate, do you need more cheese? No, we're done? No, we're done with the And cheese. this plate, I'm going to go put into put in the refrigerator. refrigerator to get chilled. And then we're gonna make our batter and then we'll be ready to go. Okay. All right, right now, now for the batter. Okay. Tempura batter. Tempura batter. So what, what are we, we doing? What we have here is a combination of flour, 
And we have two cups of flour there. Then I have two tablespoons of cornstarch. Um, thickening agent. <laughs> thickening agent. And Less then likely is, to be lumpy. This, well, th with this you want it to be somewhat lumpy. lumpy. And then we're going to put um, one, or two tablespoons of baking powder in there. Okay. And then I season the batter a little bit with white pepper mm -hmm. and kosher salt. You can go ahead and stir that up there, okay. sous chef. And then I'm going to slowly add the water. And we don't want to over mix. Well, right now you can you can get it together. I can get it together. And that's because we don't want the gluten to come in and make it tough. Right. And we're looking for what consistency here? We're kind of looking for almost a, an oatmeal, cream of wheat kind of consistency, somewhat thick, so that it'll stick to the, the herb or the, the squash blossom that you're using. And you, can, you can mix it up. I can, little. and my goal is not to take all the lumps out, but just to have it incorporated. Yeah, just have it incorporated. And we're getting pretty much of a cereal consistency yeah. here. I think we're about ready to let it sit. Okay, so we're going to let this sit for about how long? Uh, about 10 minutes. Okay. 